Welcome to solo episode number five of the Culture and Leadership Connections podcast. And the topic today is understanding our spiritual nature and its relationship to work, taken from the beginning of the book I'm writing called The Spirit of Work. As I explained in the last podcast episode, the whole event of COVID-19 has caused me to feel compelled to share some of the work I've been doing on the book in advance and to get some response from people to see if it might assist them, but also so I can get some feedback and learn from the ideas of others. Because I really believe that most of the good ideas we have only become good once we've got them informed by the experience of others and when we share in the collective wisdom. So today I wanted to talk a little bit about spiritual nature and its relationship to work, which is what the whole book, The Spirit of Work, is about. We cannot understand the nature of work without understanding that human beings are essentially, and before all else, spiritual, or that all of life and existence is animated by spirit. The creative force that animates life is the power of divine love, manifested in physical existence as proof of that love. The reason this matters so much for work is that human beings need to work as an expression of our souls. Work provides human beings with a sense of purpose, and that comes from doing what we were created to do, to learn, to grow, develop, contribute to building something bigger and better than ourselves, as individuals, as communities, and as institutions. If that purpose is lost, Our souls are at first dissatisfied and then distressed. We feel like hungry people who eat, but never have our hunger sated. Shoghi Effendi wrote in 1945, The need is very great everywhere in the world for a true spiritual awareness to pervade and motivate people's lives. No amount of administrative procedure or adherence to rules can take the place of this soul characteristic, this spirituality which is the essence of man. Now, I'm going to talk about spirituality in a way you probably have never heard before. It's going to be within the framework of something that is based on the traditions of the world religions and great thinkers, and also informed by spiritual practice that we have been garnering and learning about over time. It is not going to be something about mindfulness, meditation, or about people practicing their own individual spiritual practices. Although that will inform some of the things that I say, it is also not going to be upholding any particular system other than the one that I've developed by putting all these ideas together. It offers a framework for reimagining work in a way that is consistent with being a spiritual human being and living in a spiritual context with spiritual stewardship of the planet. I'm going to explore a few ideas with you and hopefully have you respond to me so that I can expand them further. So today I wanted to talk about work as human development and coming from the idea that first off we are spiritual beings and spiritual relating to our purpose, sense of who we are, and a whole lot of other characteristics I'll explain as we go along. We need to place it in the context of how people develop and how the world develops in order to understand what would be healthier for work and for workplaces. So if we observe children as they grow and develop, we'll see that it's almost impossible for them to stop learning and doing at the same time. Even if they're in stunted or abusive situations, at the very first opportunity, children learn because that's just their nature, just as it is the nature of plants to grow and animals to move. Children flourish through play, which is, in its essence, the spirit of work. Children playing have the serious intent of scientists mixed with the delight in discovery of artists. Like philosophers, they create theories about how the world works based on their experiences. They interact socially to learn together and to create imaginative scenarios that test possibilities. When you try to distract children from their purposeful work, they become angry because they invest all their energy and powers into the task they've assigned to themselves. It could be learning to stand, speak, draw, write, make a friend, apologize for a mistake, ride a bicycle, understand language. They perfect each tiny step of development with tireless repetition, not as a chore, but as a delight. If they're frustrated in their goal, they creatively and persistently, even aggressively, seek ways around it until they get to their purpose. Through this process, their talents and interests emerge, and they speak endlessly on any topic they've decided to investigate and research. Even when they're not engaged with intensity in their growth and development, 
taking rest and changing activities only serves to provide depth and context to their incessant need to learn and to perfect their skills. As they develop, their social abilities and skills contribute to their capacities to build on each other's ideas and initiatives. And in all things, they participate actively, reflect deeply, explore creatively, interact socially, and invent new realities. This is one of the secrets to the spirit of work that we can learn from observing children. They can teach us much about the nature of the soul and about how to work more effectively. Work that does not encourage the natural expression and development of the soul is not sustainable because it is against our nature. Isms and ideologies restrict, imprison, limit, and stop the natural expression of the human spirit, stun to altruism, and seek to extinguish the light of the soul. Look, for example, at the typical efforts of dictators and autocrats towards their very own people. They stop free speech, forbid intellectual development, hinder publications, imprison writers, banish artists, and torture thinkers. They then force what is left of the arts and the sciences to be caged within the constraints of a limited space or face severe life-threatening consequences. To become godlike in their powers, they reduce all possibilities of divine expression. In so doing, they shrink their own capacity because aggression towards others deprives the aggressor's soul of grace. Unfortunately, this is also the reality of many workplaces. Unlike the reality of children developing through work, adults are often imprisoned in their workplaces. When a large percentage of a given workplace is moderately to actively disengaged, and the majority of those leaving do so as a result of feeling demoralized by their bosses, it is a clear sign that we have not yet, as a human race, learned to build our adult work from within the realities of our souls. Lack of purpose in an organization results in scattered and deluded efforts that cause the workforce to regard initiatives with cynicism and with suspicion. Unlike young children who cannot be discouraged from soul-inspired learning and action in their work, as adults, we become trapped in a cycle of purposelessness that does not satisfy and ultimately erodes our potential as individuals and as organizations. So where do we start to fix this problem? How can we heal ourselves in our workplaces? How do we reestablish purpose, value, passion, ethics? We need some simple tools to keep us soul focused and to bring some autocorrect function into our work decisions. And one of these tools can be the use of probing questions. One in particular can be revealing to evaluate all our attitudes and behaviors, both in and outside work, as either diminishing or enhancing the nature of our souls. So here is the essential probing question I've come up with that we can ask ourselves in this investigation of the spirit of work. It is, is the action I am about to take, my thought or my behavior, soul sustaining or soul diminishing? Soul enhancing activity brings love, joy, creativity and growth to us and to others. We become both self and other aware in soul enhancing activity. On the other hand, soul diminishing activity fosters anger, hatred, destruction, and isolation. Soul diminishing activity makes us self-absorbed and unaffected by our actions on others. There's a big difference between self-absorption and self-awareness. Self-awareness typically leads to other awareness. Self-absorption leads to restricted thinking and behavior and addictive thinking. So if you think about it, we can apply this probing question pretty much immediately to our lives by putting it into every context that we experience. Do I feel like making a point of someone else's fault? Hmm, soul diminishing. Can I think of a way to share the irritation I feel towards that person, but in a way that is kind and honest? Ah, now this is a soul enhancing question. Do I snap at others because I'm tired? Soul diminishing. What if I take a deep breath and let others know I feel tired and just might not be at my best? Soul enhancing. Do I share in the joy of someone's promotion? Soul enhancing. Do I feel bitter and jealous at someone's promotion? Soul diminishing. Do I apologize when I make a mistake? Soul enhancing. Do I blame others for my mistakes? Soul diminishing. You get the point. Asking this question about my behaviors can help me intentionally improve them. Asking this question about my thoughts can help me orient towards virtue. But only if I have acknowledged the negative feelings and their triggers. More about that later. Suffice it to say that as our words and deeds become more and more aligned with soul-enhancing habits, other issues in our lives, 
start to autocorrect themselves, which is the power of the spirit of work. So I'm going to stop there by giving you an action item. Your action item from this episode about the relationship between our spiritual nature and the nature of work is to do an inventory of your thoughts, actions, and behaviors at the end of each day. Ask yourself, did most of my actions and thoughts tend towards soul enhancing or soul diminishing? Try and think of a few specific examples. Be happy about those positive ones and they will start to increase because what you pay attention to grows. Paying attention to your own soul behaviors is the first step in understanding how to infuse the power of the spirit of work into your life and into your workplace. So that's the first part of the book. And you can comment on this or any of my podcast episodes in our Work and Culture Twitter account, or you can send an email to Marie at shiftworkplace.com. Oh, and a third way is you can leave a voice message in my Skype account, which is A-M-G-E-D-U-C. That's A-M-G-E-D-U-C. I'm really looking forward to your responses. On another level, if any of these new things inspire you to want to work with me, I would really love to hear from you. I don't know if wanting to work with me would be a discussion, if it would be a project, or if it might be that we enter into some kind of a client relationship where you become my client or I become yours. We can chat and see what might be beneficial to both of us. Thank you for listening, and may the understandings and insights about work and culture continue to guide and inspire your day.